Recording is on. Well, hello, everybody. It's Wednesday, and it's uh, November the 17th, 2021. So this is just um, a chat between Tom and Hugh. So uh, Tom had some questions that he asked in an email, and so we'll just go through them and discuss them. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, yeah, good. Yeah, not too bad. Just getting through the malaise of the dark winter. <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know if you wanted to go reference from the email or yeah, I had a few bits I wrote just to kind of read off. So I'm not which, sure which way around. We should yeah, get... yeah, read through them and see. Let's go one at a time. Okay, so. Yeah, so I went back to to one of the conversations with Hank, um, Kali versus the patriarchy. Um, I think it's good to remind ourselves that we're kind of bearing all to help ourselves and help others through these times. As Hank said at the start of that video, I think it's all very well talking about the science and predicament. But how do we deal with this on an individual level? Who do we speak to? I guess this is a kind of going back a bit but <laughs> it kind of I don't know I think it's worth kind of repeating um for maybe there's new people who are a bit shy or I don't know have missed some of the previous conversations so yeah I just wanted to I was just saying yeah thinking that I've been feeling these waves of despair recently um, yeah, but it's not the waves of despair I felt years ago after I fully comprehended all of the hard data and science or since COP26 as well, <laughs> after Lovelock and McPherson. This despair or deep depression is different. Um, and I was thinking back to, I think it was yeah, the weekend before last, I was with uh, I was with some friends of my girlfriend. Um, spare me, I'm kind of reading off notes here. Um, and <clears throat> I only met them twice before, uh, mid-30s couples, both in well-paying careers. They've just had their first kid, and now they're all cosily installed in their newly renovated suburban house, about as cookie-cutter as you get in suburban England. It was amazing to see how that archetype of 1950s family at, at idyll carries on, regardless. It's such a powerful aspiration. It was also striking how they seem completely unfazed by the future or having been affected by the pandemic in the slightest. They were keen to talk about planning ski trips and driving their fancy new Mercedes Benz down to the Alps. I felt almost like an alien sat there, <laughs> observing my alien cortex, getting jealous at how happy and content they both were, but at the same time, very sad for them and for us as a species, I suppose. It seems as though nothing will stop people from having their excessive lifestyles until the bitter end. The inequality and grotesqueness of it all will just get starker and louder until the bitter end. Like the last days of Rome or the Third Reich or something like you see in these films. But for all the talk and acknowledgement, I think we are astoundingly close to the rationalization, rationalizing and justification of just about anything that we that will be sold to keep this party on the road. People will do anything to hold on to the torch of industrial civilization <clears throat> and the foundation of that, the domos. Um, I feel acute conflict over the domos. I've, I can feel my mammalian brain pining for everything that those around me have in their liberal bourgeois lifestyle, and yet I want to reject all of it. Or should I say, my AC wants to reject all of it. My AC is scheming to run away. Ironically, to run away and live closer to nature, to be nomadic in a van or some such idyll, even though I'm fully aware that, aware that there is no escape. <clears throat> I wonder if this rejection goes deeper, though, and harks back to the menfolk of ancient times who were nomadic. Um, thinking back to, you know, against the grain and thinking about the subsistence lifestyles of the nomad nomads of ancient times. It was striking how, how long it actually took for the domos to establish itself, constant back and forth when the downsides of domesticity were exposed. But incredibly dark and depressing to realise that the domos and the early states were just a positive feedback loop 
sucking in, enslaving and manipulating all who interacted with it. Um, I wonder how long it took before men, for men to be subdued and domesticated by the Domus. Do you think women had a part in persuading men it was beneficial to stay put and develop the Domus? Or, <clears throat> excuse my dodgy reading, here we go, oh God, come on. Or was it inevitable that men would be attracted to the idea of domesticity without the need, any need for women folk to cajole or persuade? Um, but yeah, so anyway, we'll start with a little bit of that. Yeah, I don't know, there's just some thoughts I wrote down. So. Yeah, there's thoughts that occupy me a lot too these days. So my uh, thinking's changing on what we should do. I, yeah, let's start with the first bit about, you know, being a Duma in a in a world that doesn't really see the big picture or see much into the future. So a <laughs> short-sighted world. Um, my thinking these days is, okay, just for uh, just a, an admission that I've, I've screwed up a number of times with people um, just because I've let the doom around <laughs> a bit too liberally. And um, you never get a good reaction, <laughs> understandably. Um, People just don't want to hear the truth. So I think uh, I'm starting to think these days that you shouldn't really go there with people that uh, that are, are not into the, <laughs> into that, that are just living their lives. In in a lot of ways, I think we should respect that because um, we don't really know the future, right? So the doomerism is is our our conclusion. I mean, it's a pretty good. <laughs> You can guess, but there's there's room for doubt, and in essence, it, they may be doing the smart thing. So the very first thing I think that we have to put in, you know, up front, it's kind of said in the, in the desiderata, but the very first thing I think you get punished if you don't do this, and that's you have to put the reality and the truth up front, and try and be kind of. A really hard taskmaster remorseless with yourself in putting the, the actual truth up but that's something i've a conviction i've held all my life so if we say that and we say we really are we want to stand by the truth of the matter <laughs> unvarnished there's probably nothing we can do to alter the fate of the world there's probably you know it's it's really not going to happen so it's it's really going to be how it is and if it is really going to wind up in, in a lot of trouble, sort of McPherson style or even, you know, Roger Hallam style, you know, maybe they, uh, they're they doing the right thing, just kind of living their life, just <laughs> living out their last days on reprieve, right? So what I'm warning against is that there, there's a danger in um, feeling too aloof as a Duma to think that you're superior and might know the future that they, you know, even if it's true, they, you know, it might be the smarter move to just live blind <laughs> and, and let the blind be the blind. I don't, I don't really think so in, in myself, but I think you should always leave room for that doubt. <laughs> that, uh, that's that's, so that's, interesting. Interesting. that's really interesting yeah. i'm surprised to hear you say that because yeah i think there's this constant back and forth where it's a bit like um, it makes me think of i guess kind of i'm pretty early to to all this i mean obviously not as early as you know like yourself and like yeah late late boomers who are but i mean i read lovelock's book in 2009 but I, I think I kind of put it to the back shelf. I kind of did have a lot of grief at that time when I went through a lot of his work. And then it all, you know, really started ramping up again in kind of 2017, 2018. And that was kind of when I I started thinking, yeah, I, I, I don't know, you know, like, is it, you know, you know it, it's that conflict of, it's almost like, yeah, the alien cortex, it's, it's that conflict coming in and wanting to to push it aside and say well who knows we don't know maybe you know maybe not and then everything has just gone yeah hyperbolic in that space with xr i suppose um but yeah i mean i don't know i 
It was interesting. I had a conversation with a friend at the weekend, and he is, it was funny because a few times we have gone there, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, like, we're fucked. Like, we got to the end, you know, and he kind of, like, hands up. But then it didn't really go much further because I could feel the discomfort. But like you're saying, most people, you don't go there. But I, I have gone there with him, but he's still rationalizing over the technology and he said something really interesting. He brought up the metaverse, and I'd never heard that argument. And I don't know if he – I said to him, did you think of that? And he said, yeah, I was thinking about it the other day. But maybe he subconsciously heard it. He said one of the rationale for, oh, the metaverse is going to be great because what we'll be able to do is that will be the replacement for the economy. So people won't need physical products. Like kids will be able to buy emojis or, you know, um, avatars and things for computer games within the metaverse. And I, I'd only just heard about this metaverse a few weeks ago, but I was like, all oh, right, is that, you surely have just heard that from Zuckerberg or something. But he was rationalizing that as the, so I had to concede, I had to say, okay, well, that's great if some people can live in that. I don't want to live in the fucking metaverse, but maybe, yeah, if they can convince like a huge majority and the rest of us could just go off and be happy not living in the economy. If they want to live in their virtual economy, like, Great, I don't know. And then they black out the sun with the yeah. <laughs> but it it is avoidance behavior. So the the metaverse is old. It's not Zuckerberg's. The, if you go and have a look at, uh, I went and had a look at the metaverse Reddit sub, and I, I think it's about ten years old. It's, but the the idea for the metaverse is I had this idea. <laughs> In the late 80s, in the, when I saw this, um, exactly Zuckerberg's ideas, uh, as I wanted to do it in the late 80s, when I was much younger. So, so I, I saw um, this game, which was, uh, it was a computer game, and, uh, but it, it was um, non-collaborative, but it was, it was all basically had a, a universe. It was a um, immersive kind of game, quite quite advanced for the time. And as soon as I saw it, I I didn't like gaming, but I said, "Hang on a minute. You should do this with an economy and and put up virtual things, have people being able to have a second life." I did, it was basically second life, and um, the everybody talked me out of it because in those days I used to listen to what people had to say. I eventually learned not to do it, not to listen to what anybody said because they don't they don't tell you what's really going to happen or any helpful suggestions. Especially in the UK, they just tell you, "Nah, it'll never work." And then and so what what they told me in the in the years that they have this like "Nah, it'll never work" syndrome. Um, but they uh, they said no, dial up is too expensive. It needed dial up. To make it collaborative, right? And at those times, startup was expensive as all hell. Phone calls used to be really expensive, and so it was, you know, way pre-internet and free stuff. Um, yeah, gamers, and, gamers used to meet up, didn't they, in um, in rooms and network and link all their computers. I had friends that did that um, in the early days. They would have, you know, sleepovers and they'd all bring their computers and do gaming nights. Um, you know, because obviously you weren't going to game over the internet. It would be terribly slow or incredibly expensive. Well, yeah, um, you could uh, have a server that you dialed into and then there was just enough bandwidth to actually coordinate the game and coordinate the thing. So it would have worked, but everybody said, that, said I, was, I was amazed because I actually looked now on that Reddit sub and these guys were said exactly the same argument that uh, people said to me and they said, look, nobody's going to pay good money for a virtual thing. It's just bits and bytes. It doesn't cost you anything to make once you've made it. Maybe, you know, I was thinking you make a spaceship and people could transport goods and earn money and then have an exchangeable with real world money so that people could actually have a job in the metaverse. But um, they said, no, there's no ways people would do that. And I said, of course they would do that. They'll do it because it's like the stock market. Nobody cares what the stock is behind it or whether it's physical or virtual. They just care that the stock's going to go up and they're going to make money. Exactly. It's exactly the same as um, the cryptocurrency market in the space. As, you know, it's, it's like the Wild West and people, you know, are 
throwing money left, right and centre into shiny objects and crazy, stupid scams. And it's just like it's got a white, fancy white paper and a, you know, a lovely little symbol. And like, yeah, people, they go for it. It's it's just the same as the it's almost like those, you know, those flints in um, in the at Gobekli Tepe, isn't it? That people love their shiny objects that will increase in value. So and and yeah. you get it also in um uh yeah recently yeah they re-released was it that sims there was this channel um this right wing channel and this guy they were laughing about it because they're having a group chat a bit like our group and um and they were talking about oh yeah it's funny because he bought this other guy in the chat he bought him a character of himself you know uh as a like, you know a funny avatar of him and he paid like through the nose for it like crazy amount. This was like a revamp of Sims. I never, I don't know anything about it, but yeah, some kind of. <clears throat> oh, so yeah, I mean, uh, Zuckerberg might be handed his ass on a, on a tray. I mean, this might be the end of him because it, it could have, you know, Pokemon Go, but it just have a fad value and then it would die out quickly. But if, you know, it's such a common idea and it was actually before the, the the old days of the hippies before the internet took off pre pre 97 they they actually saw this as the internet so the internet eventually came you know with html and people just had web pages as shop fronts but for a while there in the late 90s these um internet gurus and hippies and stuff they they all thought it was going to be literally storefronts that you walk down in a virtual world. So in other words, malls and stuff, trans you know, transferred to the virtual world, you know, kind of what Zuckerberg is doing now. But yeah, so um, the people are going to go into it if they, if the Zuckerberg doesn't make it happen, then somebody else will do it. So, so the thing is, what, what you do it is, I, to me, it's an appalling world. I hate those virtual worlds and stuff every time i put on vr goggles and that what strikes me is that the worlds are so dead the, this everything the the echoes and stuff are just you know there's there's no life in them um they're like walking through a mausoleum incredibly depressing um so uh the only way i think it'll work is if they have porn the whole thing that would make it or break it is porn and so but anyway, it's a hellscape. It's really the it literally is the matrix. But um, so so the question is then, what do we do about it? And I was thinking um, a couple of things. I think like okay, we should say that you know there's we can't do much. I mean about the outcome of doom that we all headed for, um, we we must accept that that's that's a given. So all the stuff that's you know, Insulate Britain is doing an XR. It's it's a pointless waste of time because you know that nobody's going to voluntarily give this stuff up. Nobody's really going to do 500 lone wolves. It's very difficult to get a, an ar you know an army that would do ecotage and sabotage to sabotage the system. It's it's doable, but the there's also the danger that they would build it back up again so it's kind of like geoengineering it's kind of you know hard social engineering so i don't have much faith in in 500 lone wolves or something actually doing it it would just be part and parcel of the dystopia so a couple of things come to mind and so yeah i think that one thing we should bear in mind is that None of these things can go too far. I think we're on the short haul. Something like, you know, blue ocean event in the Arctic about 2025 20, to 2030. There, thereafter, I think the, the clath rates in the ESAS and around the world will start venting. The sources of methane are going to go nuts. So, you know, that, I think that that would, would happen soon after, if, you know, if not. I mean, they're already venting now, but uh, yeah, I think there would be a clutch rate burst or a major runaway in methane pretty soon after 2030. So, so we're talking about 20, 20 30 years or so. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, what I'm going to propose on, on Sundays, we change direction for the Extinction ID. And I think 
really uh, just make it all, all about the flippening. And I think that the, the flippening is coming soon. <laughs> There's no way it isn't. So you have to think in terms of what do you do about all these things? Hey, you know, people that are just putting their heads in the sand, people that are going for the matrix, just how, how you live with all this kind of delusion, knowing that it's then time. And this kind of idea comes to me that, well, you have to say, well, you know, if you, okay, how's this for proposition? If you had a time machine and you went back in time to say 1900 or something like the Edwardian era, um, the, the Gilded Age, you know, yeah, you, you would, you know, you would be amongst all these people having a very nice time, and you'd be saying like, "Don't you know, by 1914, World War One, the, the whole generation is going to be lost. There's going to be gas in the trenches. All you guys who are happily, you know, playing cricket here are going to be in the mud in Flanders in, in 15 years." Um, you wouldn't do that, would you? You would say, "Isn't you know?" You would treat it like a movie and say, "You know, like, oh, it's." Uh, Funny thought to thinking that while we're having tea here, that all, that all these guys are going to be dead. <laughs> no, I, I, I do agree with that because, as you have often said, and it, it does strike me as, yeah, it's like a pretty incredible show. Um, and I do, I, it's funny, yeah, you, when you put that, you've often said that, it does make you think, yeah, like there's just so many crazy things. It's like, yeah, like if you go back even, what is it? Yeah, it's sort of getting on for two years now since the start of the pandemic. And I was really early doors on sort of hearing the news on that. And it, it sort of looked dodgy. And I said, ah, oh, you know, maybe that's the plan. You know, I was sort of being jokingly sort of saying, you know, this is this is like a, this is the plan. So it only affects old people. You know, this is this will wipe out the old people so they won't have to pay the old people's pensions. I was sort of joshing with people, but... You know, I was having a laugh about it. And then as it was unfolding, I was like, this is a really good movie. <laughs> I was never exactly, I don't know, I was in a few moments where I got a little bit concerned. Um, but I think I've, yeah, I, I think that's a good mentality because like we were saying to take it back, yeah, you can't really, it's, the one aspect I would like to touch on is like onboarding or not, I don't like that term, that sounds terrible, but yeah, basically, if you've got loved ones that are close to you, how do you, because I've said this to my girlfriend and things and, you know, told her and laid it all out, but she's pretty mute. I mean, she's completely on board with how bad it is, but I don't think she's sort of reached the point of fully grasping how bad it is. Maybe I haven't spelled it out hard enough. So there's those, so there's those people. Do you just let go and just not worry about those people? Obviously I'm, they are probably because they're close to you. That's probably more important to at least try and I don't know get them on board a little bit. Or is it? Or do you just go fuck it, like uh, you know, <laughs> and and oh, leave it? I mean, yeah, it, yeah it, it's a it's a hard one. It's that conflict, isn't it? Mm -mm. I don't think we've talked enough yeah. about our individual situations, our families, and I don't want to get this to like I don't know. It shouldn't be like live therapy, but. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No, no, I, I think it should be like therapy. I think that's what people need. Yeah, so so my view on this is that I think I kind of feel a, a sense of responsibility for being a doomer. Is if we are doomers and we're right, um, we owe we owe it to, you know, as the sighted ones <laughs> to everybody else. But what I the way I see it is you kind of have to be like crocodile Dundee figure and kind of, you know, like you don't push it. Right. So you don't, you don't try and onboard people. You just say like, you know, like crocodile Dundee has, a, you know, it, at least the way it's scripted is that he knows everything. It's kind of like these hero characters like Tintin or whatever. They, they, they know everything. They'd like 10 moves ahead of the movie in the audience. And, you know, they kind of, you know, but they don't make a big fuss out of it. Everything's smooth going. <laughs> they make sure everybody's comfortable and feeling good. And when the time comes, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, we knew 20 years ago that that was going to happen. <laughs> it was like, what you mean? <laughs> you mean the earth was going to flip? Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't wouldn't worry about it. I've sorted it out. I know how to handle it. <laughs> and you have to be that kind of character. I think I think um, that's... that. 
it's the burden of your responsibility to, as a sighted person, <laughs> knowing what's going to happen, to, to treat it that way. The wrong way is to go and say to people, like, you know, hey, you know, you, this is what's going to happen, whatever you have to It's like, well, if, it, if it's true, what it means is you, you, you have to be big about it and prepare for everybody. But one one thing I had noticed with with my family and that I've 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 never pushed this kind of thing, um, but there's always a right time when it comes up. At some stage, somebody will say say something like, "Do you think it's possible that bloody bloody blah?" And you go, "Oh yeah," and they go like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just take to, it as it comes, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like the other day. Um, a colleague at work was saying about, oh, you know the guy, the, the main guy of Insulate Britain, uh, not Hallam, it's the other guy who's like a carpenter or an electrician or something. Well, his house isn't insulated, you know. He hasn't done it, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, I just lost my shit. And I just went, I just went on a bit of a rant. And I said, look, none of that fucking matters. Like, the key thing is just forget all of that shit. Like, we haven't got long until the Arctic melts. Do you know what happens when the Arctic, the, all the albedo, the white of the Arctic, you know, and I went on a massive long rant, and they just sort of sat there, and it was like one of those things about them going, oh, shit, yeah, like, do a, like, <laughs> like kind of, uh, he said, he actually said, I don't think he knows that term, but he said, oh, so, like, we're all doomed, and like, we're fucked. I was like, but yeah, kind of, like, <laughs> but I kind of let them, I rarely do that because it's so awkward and usually people just, you don't want to be that guy that's sat in the corner, you know, at the pub or whatever, being like, rah, rah, like ranting on an old man. <laughs> the end well, is not Yeah, that, that's the thing is you don't want to be like that. So I, the way I see it is that you, you, you know, you see it as a, as a play. And you just imagine it's scripted in a play. And in your part, you, for my part, I, you know, you, I would take the piss out of a guy like that, saying like, "No, what? His house isn't insulated. The bastard!" <laughs> you know, you just spin it out, and eventually, the the guy realizes that you're making fun of him, and you've one upped him. Um, you know, and so, which is, you, you know, you do, you don't want to. Be passive and just take it as a wound on yourself. Take take the stupidity as a wound. You just want to, you know, make sure he, he knows he's being an idiot. And the best way to do it is to cajole him and, you know, string him out and until eventually they realize, oh, you're taking the piss out of me, aren't you? So, of course I'm taking the piss out of you. Don't you know we all fucked? <laughs> you know, and then leave it at that. <laughs> so... So uh, don't you know that whether you put insulation or not, whether the whole of Britain is insulated, it's not going to help you because basically the, you know, the flipping's happening in like 10 years. <laughs> it's like, and then leave it at that. Just get up and walk out the room. And it's like, <laughs> and you, you leave, leave everybody like, you know, kind of gut punched. Yeah. It, it destroys your soul to let stupid people get away with stupidity. But, uh, It'll it'll destroy you if you, you know, if you come out small and diminished and let it get to you. You know, so it's better to not let it get to you and make sure that they know that <laughs> they're being stupid. <laughs> At least, so the passive aggressive doesn't hurt. <laughs> I think that you have to do that kind of thing just because it's. You have to navigate it, you know. You can't you can't unsee what you've seen, right? You can't some people try, they're going like unsubscribe from the collapse Reddit and stuff. You might try to put their head back in the air. But you can't do it. Yeah, I it's I guess it's um I think it's uh yeah, like as you say, as you said before, um, we've said many times there's there's just so many kind of there's so much information bombardment but it, it it's it's hard it, it's the same with the pandemic and all the things like that it, it really exposes it, it's exposing the system because i don't know if it's just me maybe it is just my personality i tend to sort of 
delve deep into things and I have a job where I can sit listening to all sorts of information all day long which is kind of the blessing um, and a curse because <laughs> then you you go down all sorts of rabbit holes but but yeah there's so much information and it's just this kind of willful blindness across the board now with most people I guess it is I mean it's not their fault most people like they're just getting they're just trying to put food on the table I mean I don't have kids personally so I've got one last thing to kind of worry about at the moment but so maybe i have more time to debate to this where other people are just just it's that quiet desperation like you said before like everyone's you can see it around you but it i think yeah some of us just yeah are like on that path and we can see it and it's all clear and then when you try and you think it's amazingly obvious and everyone else is like are we on about like they just they just think you're fucking nuts don't they they just think it's like yeah that's probably another strand of conspiracy theory or something to say that it's happening much worse because they're just so infantilized aren't they that nobody i think it's yeah maybe the system it particularly in britain like the the system is just has just nursed people it's babied them along Hopefully that will come to a crashing halt soon. I mean, the NHS is is really struggling now <laughs> with all the the backlog and all the. But I mean, like today, for example, the the Bank of England, you know, they're, they're just lying there on the BBC about the rate of inflation and uh, you know it's it, yeah and what inflation is again, like we're saying that simple thing. It's uh, people just can't see the the lies for the wood for the trees. I suppose is the thing, isn't it? So I suppose, yeah, there's no point in wasting too much energy on, yeah, you know what I'm saying, in uh, trying to shout, you know, like on Speaker's Corner or something like a madman. <laughs> it's just not not worth it. <clears throat> Those people will yeah, come naturally, think... won't they? They'll come around naturally over the over the coming years. <clears throat> yeah, I think in, you should think of it more, you know, heroically, try to think heroically. I think it... It pays in times of adversity to look at like hero figures, like you know, think about like what would Winston Churchill do in my situation? Well, he probably wouldn't whinge and moan, or you know, he'd probably make the best out of it and say, you know, so rechum, you know, <laughs> it's like, and if it doesn't be all fucked, but you know, you kind of give up and don't care, so give up, don't care, and enjoy yourself, kind of thing, is be big about it i think is the way the way to be and then uh i think it helps other people to be that way too people get a kind of a strength from you so like no we are all fucked but like yeah just joy of the time that's uh that's left yeah yeah i i i'm 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 trying through this this idea of like uh what i'm gonna suggest on uh on sundays that I think the, that we should make sure that the extinction entity has our fucking ideas in line because they're not quite in line. I mean, the the kind of things that I've been saying is kind of like um, they're inconsistent with the overall thing. So it's like I'm I'm thinking we should just say everything revolves around the flipping. And the flipping is coming. There's nothing you can do about it. It's all to do with the Greenland ice, ice sheet melt. And we can't stop it. There's so much inertia in the system. Even geoengineering would be too slow to even delay it much. So you say, well, given that, is what you do is, well, all sorts of weird consequences fall out of that. One of them, one of them is you can forget personal responsibility or worrying about fossil fuels. In fact, you know, the more people that are on this planet by when the flipping comes, the more people that would suffer and die horribly. <laughs> so you think that just for humanitarian reasons, you would want it, you you would want to accelerate the flipping. If the flipping is coming and there's nothing we can do about it, you probably want to accelerate it. And so you suddenly, well, you should support the burning fossil fuels. You should support people living abundantly. Even billionaires and stuff living hard on the hog. You should say, might as well, because uh, you know, you guys, you might as well you know, have a diversity because you want something to survive it. Right? I've kind of been doing that already. I've been like, for, for a few years now, like close friends and family, they'll be like, 
oh, don't you recycle? And I was like, what's the point? Oh, I've said that. Uh, like, have you not seen like the documentary? He's like, most of it goes to landfill. There was whole air hang air um, craft hangers full of, you know, compressed tin cans and like, and then they couldn't they couldn't ship it to China or whatever because the market for it crashed. It's like most of it goes to landfill, don't you know? Like, there's loads of people that come out that work for various councils that say a lot of it does. I mean, still do a little bit, but it's like another thing with the electric cars. Like, friend, he's like barking on about yeah you know they should have got saying about my friends with the my, fr- my girlfriend's friends with their brands banking new mercedes-benz suv whatever it is and he said oh they should have got a tesla i was like why why should they have got a tesla like you know they're fucking expensive and the shit customer service like like <laughs> there was some guy on youtube saying that he had his it was his that he sent it back because there was frosting and the condensation and the rear light and the spoiler was coming off and there was a mark inside on the bodywork and then they didn't fix any of it i said what well, you know it's not very good is it for <laughs> so i just kind of like i do little things like that in my every day just to wind people up and he's like oh but man i stand next to my diesel van and it's horrible it's you know it's so polluting and stuff and i'm like yeah but how much is a electric car gonna get you cost you to get it's gonna cost you a fortune you know and you know what could you have spent the rest of that money on you know could have gone for a lot more surfing trips or whatever he likes doing yeah so i don't know yeah i, I definitely get that <clears throat> yeah yeah just and also you want to you know just think about the uh the aerosol masking effect so as soon as uh, you know if, if you do say, oh well, the sooner the flipping comes, the better, because no no one's gonna no one's gonna voluntarily deindustrialize. It would take a you know to stop the flipping would take a massive deindustrialization, and even then it's probably not gonna happen. So I mean, even then it it probably there's enough inertia in the climate, so you wouldn't even stop it then. But yeah, you, you know, you think well, if you want to accelerate. Uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. You, you, you. Everything is good, even solar panels and farms, and green energy. Because you say, well, you want to get all the, you know, aerosols out of the air because that that will add 0.66 of a degree. So you know, what would be best is what exactly is happening is that India burns coal, China burns coal for the, you know until 2050 or 2060, and um, like they intend to, and uh, so we ramp up all the greenhouse gases, all the aerosols in the air, and then we go green with green technology, have all the aerosols fall out, and then so, you know, China, China's growth and India's growth should take us up to about two degrees, and then, you know. If we all go green after that, all the aerosols fall out of the air, you probably get an extra degree. Well, three degrees is probably ample to you know, make the Greenland ice sheet fall apart. I only need one or two percentage, and the Zanny Beckov effect will come into play, and we get a complete wipe the sled clean edge sketch. <laughs> and the sooner that happens, the better. So I think you should say, well, you might as well just say, like, just, just enjoy yourself. There's nothing you can do, and anything you can do should be accelerating it. apart from that just let everybody know we're all screwed might as well party whatever you do you might as well pray party it's all good burn fossil fuels that's good go green yeah that's good get the aerosols up whatever anybody does they kind of check me and so i think i think yeah i think that's, i think that's the thing that winds me up the most is the yeah, it's just the idea that is floated around that it's all on us. Um, it's been said many times before by people in our communities saying like, oh, you know, if we all just have this, you know, it's down to us. And it's like my friend said, we went out, so we did, um, we went out. Um, I like the idea of going, you know, getting back to nature as much as possible. Um, and we went, yeah, we went out um pushing our bikes and bike packing and we camped in the woods and had a fire so we chewed the fat for quite a few hours but yeah he he was uh he was saying this um you know i said what well, it won't matter you know because this cop 26 we didn't get china or india to come but why should we you know why do you believe in the leaders and he said oh but we have to show an example and you know 
and they had to come to you know show a point and i was like it's just laughable they didn't it's just you know it's just all a farce you know most of it's already been agreed before and it's all just a con you know and he, he just yeah wouldn't accept it uh, <laughs> it's funny but yeah i i don't know what my point was but I guess, yeah, it's just the idea that he said, we have to show example, someone has to show example. I was just trying to get the message across to him that they don't give a shit. Their mindset is completely different. It's like what Ryan was saying, you know, and uh, people that understand the Chinese, you know, that they're on a different wavelength, aren't they? they the Eastern mind is different. And, and you know, and anyway, from a simplistic point of view, they would say, well, you know, why shouldn't we, you know? you guys are in decline, we're on the rise, or they think they're on the rise anyway, <laughs> but who knows <clears throat> but, but whether they uh, Yeah, there's no McPhersons in China, as far as I know. And so the, yeah, they don't know. The people in India and China, they, they, they have a much shorter viewpoint. So people, poor people in Africa, they're like, you know, it's again, it's like we worry about the end of the week, you worry about the end of the world because for most people in india and africa it's like yeah you know industrialization has made their life so shitty that uh don't really care about the end of the world it, it's a relief they're at the bottom of the heap they're not enjoying themselves they're not in the metaverse and so you know it would be a blessed relief if uh, if if the whole world uh, destroyed itself so yeah, so they they semi suicidal. I don't think that the, those countries are uh, ever going to deprive themselves or stop. Uh, so, and uh, and who are we to even say you know that they should? Because we we're like guys on a lifeboat. We eat all the food and then say, hey, you know, we're down to starvation rations. So you know, everybody's got to stop eating now. <laughs> and they say, like, hang on a minute, you scoffed a lot. <laughs> so they, you know. What do you say in that point of view? So, so yeah, I, I think I'm thinking it through, but I think in terms of what what's hurting everybody and the, the way things are going, what what's going to be painful for people is they need to just let go in any scenario. The th what's hurting people is hope and they just can't let go. If, if everybody accepted that we are, are all absolutely irredeemably fucked and you can't do anything about it, um, it would work from almost every angle because if there is a hope and we all calm down and deindustrialize, it's kind of like after COVID. Everybody has a little we think and decided like, fuck it, you know, my life's almost over. I'm going to live a quality life, do things that matter. If everybody did that and stopped this pursuit of economic growth, we would have a chance uh, maybe of um, of avoiding catastrophe. Um, at least it wouldn't be like now everybody's trying to pursue economic growth and trying to keep the industrial system going. So the industrial system would stop if people just lost hope and said, no, we all fucked, there's no point. Nobody would. Nobody's enjoying the industrial system. They all think it's going to pay off someday. But as soon as they realize that's not going to pay off, we all fucked, then, then you know, it would be kind of like um, emancipation. People would... You know, it's like no one would bother going on strike. Nobody would fight. Nobody would argue. Because they say, like, no, we all fucked. It would be in, we'd all be in hospice from then on. So it works any way you look at it, because if everybody behaved like they were in hospice, they would have a very low carbon footprint. Nobody, some people are going to go nuts for sure, but it's very short-lived. You can, you can only party <laughs> for so long. Um, and then you... You know, it kind of, you've got to sober up. And so, I mean, even if you go and buy a yacht or a big car and a gas guzzler and stuff, is they're like, well, knock yourself out. But you're going to get pretty bored. I mean, it's like jet skis and boats and stuff. If you don't actually enjoy the thing, you're just doing it for a power trip. Man, they wear out quick. So even if people got all that shit out of their system, um, I think everybody would calm down a bit. And would be a better hospice if we, if we, you know, I think we are hitting the wall, <laughs> but it would be a better final time for us all if we hit the wall that way. Everybody would um, kind of sober up and get away. So it, it seems to me that's the way it should be, is you should make everybody absolutely lose hope. 
um, and, uh, and lose the sense of agency and just give up. If everybody gave up, yeah, then we're great from all points of view. It's, it's this continual fighting, fighting for a future, fighting to save civilization, fighting for a better life. Everybody's fighting, fighting, fighting. You just say like, yeah, as soon as we know we fucked, we can start enjoying ourselves. And then, um, yeah, when, uh, and then, and also when they start enjoying themselves, they might think in terms of uh, being a bit more altruistic and thinking, well, we want somebody to survive. And so we might as well start thinking, who, you know, in, the, in the sense of who do you want to survive, even the billionaires get a free pass because you, you want diversity. We don't really know how it's going to go down. You don't really know how the flipping is going to go down. So if you say like, well, are the billionaires going to go into space and have a, you know, like a Jeff Bezos have a space um, colonies and then they all ride out the flipping and then come back to Earth? And you say, like, yeah, why the hell not? So, like, we, we don't want psychopaths to inherit the earth, and these guys are sociopaths and psychopaths. But, like, I'd rather psychopaths inherited the earth than no one was left. I don't want to know. It, it's a terrible thought for me that all of humanity is wiped out. So, so what it leaves you is uh, enemies of the monoculture. You don't want a monoculture because everybody's in the same basket. If we're all in this industrial monoculture we're all vulnerable but if we have lots of guys you know let the billionaires go to space so everybody has a has a chance let the piraha have a go the indigenous people let all these people in pockets let people go on boats to you know knock yourself out just live a diverse life and let's see who can survive so and then you know hopefully in a very diverse and um heterogeneous worlds some people will sneak through it'll be a tremendous bottleneck i think only a handful of people are going to make it but uh yeah it kind of you can kind of forgive everybody yeah i think um yeah that's that's a really good point actually yeah yeah i mean yeah definitely let the billionaires go to the moon <laughs> and fail that would be good um but um yeah, I don't know. I don't want to get too dark, but yeah, you kind of think. Yeah, I think a lot of people will just top themselves. I definitely think that because I've had that myself, where you like, if you have a like a major crisis in your life, or or just even some of the sort of despair that I was talking about earlier from all of this, uh, from you know, from collapse, the long emergency, whatever, yeah, climate disruption, whatever you want to call it. And you do, yeah, you do find yourself. Uh, I was really listening to yeah some of the early talk about the caged chimp and about yeah like the breakdown, you know, having that breakdown. And I, I don't know, I think I'm getting close, but it's like yeah, you do sort of think, man, like yeah, if I'm, you know, if I'm a, if I, I hope I'm a bit more enlightened, and I'm sort of saying, oh no, I catch myself, like you don't want to do that. Like that's a, that's a shit way to go. Like why, you know going to miss out there's going to be loads to see like we were saying and you just think yeah i mean how many people already are just like topping themselves because they're victims of the system you know so that guy um yesterday there was a guy he was a failed asylum seeker in uk um apparently yeah like completely under the radar um young guy i think was he syrian anyway he was he went through the whole ringer, you know, trying to become UK citizen. But um, and then he joined. He was a uh, became a Christian um, in some church group up in Liverpool. And then um, he um, he got so desperate. In the end, he there was a chap on the radio who who the guy ended up living with this guy and this him and his wife. They were members of this church group. And they said he was, you know, a lovely chap. They really liked him and stuff. And then, yeah, I think they got him back on his feet because he was about to be homeless out on the street. But, yeah, he um, he made a bomb over this. looks like he was trying to build it over the last several years. And, um, yeah, and then it went off at the weekend, I think. I don't know the exact. He was in a taxi or something. The bomb went off and he was killed. But they were just, like, raiding all the ha homes at the moment. And they were all saying, oh, you know, like, but he was such a nice guy and stuff. and. It's and they were like having all these vox pops of all the people in Liverpool going, it's barbaric. How can anyone do that? And it's like, it's because he was a victim of the system. Like, it's probably you know, it's not. Yeah, that's what 
this system makes some people end up doing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, of course, it's extre- he is an extremist, but what created that extremism? It was the system. He got to the end of his tether, whether that be the religious system, the, yeah, like the government societal system. And the guy was, yeah, um, obviously couldn't find his way. They didn't really go into too much detail about what happened after he was, you know, because he was almost homeless, but he obviously got brought back into society. But maybe the whole thing was a cover from the start and he was just still an Islamic extremist, um, was harboring those ideas deep down. I'm not sure, but it kind of made me feel like if that is the narrative that he he was just trying to do what everyone else does and just trying to you know, get by in life and he wanted to be a UK citizen and then he found, oh shit, it's not actually that good here. Look what they've done to me. <laughs> they fucked me over. <laughs> well, this was, I may as well have just stayed where I was and I don't know. Like, you just sort of think what happened there, yeah. You never know because the narrative will be controlled, won't it? <clears throat> well, it's, uh, it's going to come in big waves. So, the you know, I've been warning people for for a while that this this kind of uh, lone wolf incel stuff that they've been uh, preparing for it the state has been preparing for it UK and uh, the US has been preparing for it because uh, that's an obvious thing when collapse comes is that's that's what those guys are going to do kind of uh, like suicide by cop kind of things is, is rampant in, in America so yeah and more and more of these things will uh, people will team up and form sects and cults, and so yeah, I was thinking for a while that you know you could just five hundred of these guys well prepared doing things like EMPs could uh, end end the system, but um, I'm starting to toy with the idea that you know well first that's not going to happen. It, it well it's going to happen, but it's not going to be decisive, so it's not going to. It's not going to change the results of the collapse. It's not going to avoid collapse by bringing that kind of acceleration of a collapse. I don't think actually achieves the result and holds it down. So I um, and, or stops it coming back up again. So I think, yeah, I'm starting to think that just put all the eggs in the in the basket of the flipping. And uh, uh, yeah, sorry, just to say, yeah, I mean, you could, of course. There have been patsies. Um, there's been a few um, that have happened here in the UK, I'm sure of it. Um, so, yeah, you can't obviously, that could be another tactic by the system to just infantilize people more, to lock down people harder. Um, excuse the pun, like, I don't mean necessarily in terms of lockdown of like the pandemic, but yeah, like more restrictions, more control. Um, and that, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, yeah, like the Manchester bombing, things like that. It was it was ironic that that happened, you know, just after they did a training exercise. <laughs> you know, like it, it's, it's the same with like was it the bomb in the seven seven bomb as well? They did a massive training exercise, and then like yeah, a few days later or whatever, suddenly it happened. And, yeah, but anyway, yeah, no, I, I agree. Long history of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that kind of action is not really, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, it's also can you like you say it's often controlled. So Timothy McVeigh was a was a patsy. Yeah. So yeah, he was set up just like Oswald was set up. <laughs> they, they always they always have a patsy. It's the pattern. But uh, MP as well, Joe Cox. Um, I don't know if you ever heard about that, the British MP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a young, I mean, a guy, I mean, there was a guy uh, online who's done a serious deep dive and he went and, you know, went and did individual interviews with a lot of people. And yeah, police kind of turned up and other people stopped speaking to him. Yeah, they just wouldn't speak to him at all anymore because they'd clearly been lent on by the police. And then he did have, where um, police from a certain county come and start asking him questions. But there was just so much evidence. This guy was, he would not have said boo to a goose. Um, and they they uh, analysed all of the footage of the guy when he was in the, answering the questions and the voice was different. And 
the look of the guy and he didn't even have if he had like a cap on so he was just a, a you know a stooge that was put there so the guy's now in prison but she was taken out for some reason but yeah and i'm not saying that always happens but yeah you kind of think yeah there's there's so many like tricks in the bag to to sort of yeah yeah, they're all to, 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 to scare people more, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and also they they need to they they need to get somebody. So it's more important that they get somebody and get them quickly than get the right person. So you see that behavior in in our in Ireland and in South Africa, and they they just get anybody that fits the bill just to get somebody quick. They're not really they don't really care who they get. So there's there's that, and there's other ones where there's some really bad guys that are Teflon, and they can't get anything on them, and then they will pin anything on them. They, they will just make up shit to pin on them to get them. So, yeah. Either way, the, those things, though, um, I, I think, you know, we should kind of avoid those things, because they, they, they will come in in spades, and you have to think, well, how do we deal with them as an extinction artist? And you, you just, I think you just got to say that this is part of the territory of collapse and the sooner collapse happens, the better. So the two things is one, let, let everybody that, you know, those that have ears to hear, let them know that the, you know, the end is coming way quicker than people think. And, um, and then two, you know, stop them uh, losing hope and, uh, and so well I think that my view is that you should want to survive I mean I, I really would like to survive the flipping and um, I think that that should be one of the, the aims of you know if you're in the extinction party you don't intend to roll over and, and die you intend a to accelerate the flipping and survive it uh, so it's basically it's our great reset, right? It's the people's great reset, and you know, once you accept that it's coming, then you want it to come quickly. Then you're in a different world. But to me, I mean, think about it and uh, see what you th see what you th think. That's the right way to align all our motives and philosophy and stuff. In it, <laughs> put it down in that, and it's all coherent then, right? Does does that does it sound coherent when I say it like that? Yeah, definitely. I because I mean I think this came up before when I think I brought it up ages ago. Um, as a yeah, as a narrative for the the arg or yeah, as a as a I mean yeah, it's there and that is yeah, that, that's a a good aim. Um, yeah, I think it it could be an amazing place to be after something like that. It'd be it makes me think of all those programs that that you had on um, BBC leading up to the millennium. There was all these like um, there was this science program called Horizon on BBC Two, and they kept having all these documentaries. Well, one of them was the um, the one about the you know the this the um, what do you call it the the um, the masking the aerosol masking that was the famous one that McPherson kept. Pointing. McPherson was on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that was, I saw that. But that was in 2013 or something, wasn't it? Or 2003? Yeah, I think the original documentary was aired in, I seem to remember seeing it on TV, and I think it was, yeah, about, about 2006 or 2007, maybe. It might have been earlier. Yeah, it may have been 2003. But there was other ones, like, um, there was all sorts of ones. That, uh, it was like, we don't know when it's going to happen, but like, on the Canary Islands, there's one half of it, and we've seen in the past that, there was a massive landslide and half of the island went into the sea <laughs> and then it caused a tidal wave, <laughs> a massive tsunami that would go all the way out and wipe out the whole of the East Coast of America. These kind of <laughs> disaster movie things that, you know, yeah, like could happen, but just don't know when. Like, and it would be, yeah, it would be a biblical event, but um, no one knows when. It could, be, it could happen tomorrow. <laughs> So yeah, it's, that it's, thing, isn't it? it's but, good to have a biblical, a biblical apoc apocalyptic ending that you can't do anything about, right? Yeah. So then all the transhumanists, all the Zuckerbergs, and that it, it's like, you see, again, it seems to fit the bill for me because it's, it seems that 
you you want people not to be in the metaverse. It seems to me a, a, an incredible waste of time. But I don't think people will go in the metaverse if if you know if you're in hospice or on death row and you say this is you know you're in your last time on earth. Do you think people would spend it in the metaverse? I don't think so. I think they're doing it because they think they have infinite time and infinite hope. And <laughs> so you say, like, well, you want to undermine all of that. And that's the way they get people out of the metaverse. They end up with power cuts and things. I mean, it depends where you're living, but yeah, I mean, I can definitely see that coming down the road here in the UK, like power cuts. You're not really going to be able to get into... <laughs> the internet of the, people will lose their minds but they won't be able to get on the internet if there's no power will they they'll be more focused like when are we going to be able to get power to i don't know cook some food or do the washing or something probably <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> when can i get on the well mind you actually in my flip maybe <laughs> maybe the internet is more important i don't know <clears throat> Well, I, I was kind of thinking, you know, what what we should do about the metaverse. And I was thinking we should probably think of going, getting into the metaverse and uh, trying to basically do activism, you know, fuck it up. So, so you know, instead of instead of doing all these nice arts projects and stuff that, that Zuckerberg imagines everybody doing is do really disrupt stuff. You know, there's a variety of sigils around the place, and then you know, um, you know, it ba basically be uh, very anarchic and and spoil the whole thing and tell people, hey, you know, we we've come into this here to tell you that the you know, the flipping's about to come, and you shouldn't be wasting time in Zuckerberg's dystopia because the end of the world's coming soon. You know, disruptive. Try to be disruptive in this metaverse and try and. Do you speak to many, um, I don't know, Gen Z, like young people? I don't, I'm not really in touch with that many. I, there's some very, very young people that I now know, but they're too small to have an opinion on this stuff. And luckily, they're not being brought up in front of screens. But I don't know, like, I don't know, because I, I, I know that some of you have said, oh, and you can see people around Greta's age that are, like, massively concerned, but... I still get the impression from people at my work who are a bit younger than me. They're probably in their mid twenties. Well, they're quite a bit younger than me actually. Some of them are in their like mid to late twenties, and they all just seem obsessed with how great yeah everything is online and technology. I don't know. Yeah. So it seems to be like yeah, well, maybe it depends where you are. Yeah, they are obsessed, aren't they? Oh no, they are. Yeah, most. I think some survey or something says that they would. Um, what would they give up uh, to keep their cell phones? I think they would rather lose a limb or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I did hear that, yeah. But I just wonder, that is that changing in some circles? Is it maybe just a very tiny minority that are like, getting on board with the collapse bandwagon? Or are they all just, most of them are just like probably going to, yeah, take this? Because I thought they were, they were like, uh, Facebook's behind it now. Like, we're on to other stuff. Like, Facebook is what your parents are on now. <laughs> you don't want to be yeah. on that. <laughs> Oh yeah, so, you know, Facebook is boomer shit. Yeah, they're on, they're on TikTok and stuff. Yeah, I I see a lot of that stuff because of my kids, but they um I, actually do you mind just muting because I'm getting this like echo back. So so yeah, I see a lot of this from my kids, but they um I get the impression that the Gen Z and that is they they all doomers. They they kind of like already kind of in hospital in a way because they're kind of thinking well we're all screwed, there's nothing we can do about it um, our, our lives are crap, they, they're having quite a shit time, most of them and um, and then they're living pretty much in the moment and the technology and stuff is how they do everything because they're kind of domesticated, they, do, they have social anxiety and stuff but my uh, because I've you know I guess I've influenced my kids with my doomerism. And so, you know, I tell them all the time to live their best life. And surprisingly, they are. They, they Because they think they haven't really got much time and much future and things are going to get worse and worse in their lifetimes. They, they living, you know, as, you know, they're having the best time they can now. And really, and so... I think that they are kind of unusual, especially my son, because he's he's like 
really trying to make the most of it where where the others are kind of miserable because they all they all kind of miserable in their luxury so so they have a whole lot of first world problems and stuff but um they they're very soft and they're very uh they very timid and, and my son is getting more and more adventurous doing more and more adventurous things because he realizes that he hasn't got much time so it's it's worked my doom is has worked with with them i think that they can put from it i think it is a good message to tell them hey you're fucked you've you've got 20 years live your best life and that reminds me yeah of, um that kind of brings it back to that the meeting um over the weekend just about the um all the food and things like that because that reminded me of when i was younger and I actually used to have, we used to go and play on this farm and, you know, his, he was really brought up old school, you know, like that dinner time was dinner time, like no fucking snacking in between. So it was like, they went out, you know, did work on the farm and then, and we used to go out, you know, and shoot and faff around outdoors, you know, and build dens and stuff and play and stuff. And, you know, you'd, you'd feel hungry. Uh, and, and then it was like, yeah, let's go, you know, and we'd go back and they would, you know, they'd cook a big dinner and you'd have that food, but it was, it was like really deserved. And you felt, you know, it was, whereas nowadays you just have everything, don't you? It's, um, yeah, it's not, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> it's, it's definitely, yeah, too much luxury. We have everything on tap. So it's good to well, hear. Yeah, happiness is about enjoying the the little things, and um, and the, the kids are not enjoying the little things. They they're not stopping and smelling the roses. They they are pretty much in, <clears throat> um, addicted to novelty. So anything that you know, memes and and gadgets and anything that goes that's novel and exciting, they kind of, in a way, they kind of drug addicts on novelty. And and it's it's distraction. They 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 kind of um, drunk on things that will distract them from, you know, they that they know they haven't got a future. So anything that distracts them from that. But that's not quite the same as stopping and smelling the roses. But it's quite different to stop and smell the roses. To say, well, our time's short. Uh, we got to stop and smell the roses. It's kind of like um, our time's short. I'm not in tune with that i um, haven't come to terms with the fact that with fact uh i just just wanted something to take my mind of it so it's it's more like putting the head in the sand than it is um you know facing the fact that they really are screwed uh grieving having catharsis and then kind of growing up so it's kind of they they're very very immature yeah and so i think that that if we forced them to look at their doom, they, they would mature faster. So I think the faster things deteriorate, the better it is for them in a way, because it's it's bad because they they have a shitty time, but they need a shitty time. They, they don't have enough adversity. They, they're too coddled. Um, they're too soft. Um, they, their life is kind of meaningless. And I mean, that gets to the point, again, like I think we spoke before, you know, um, in relation to the, the system is just causing all these ill health effects, isn't it? It's, it causes all this depression because there's, yeah, and, and these, these food problems and all, every single sort of problem seems to be from domestication, from our way of life. It's like it, it gets, it seems to just be coming exponential. Like you hear all the time, like, because I'm of that age where most of the friends around me have either had kids or they are just had them. And there's like, you know, all these like, oh, he's allergic to this or that. And it's like, what the fuck? Like, it's crazy. Like, that, you know, so many kids, there's a guy at work and I think his kid's got asthma. He's got some other like food allergy. And, you know, it's just like, it seems to be two for penny. Everyone has asthma these days. So I don't know why that is. Um, it's probably because the house is too clean, you know, you know, it's, it's, just seems to be allergic to everything, don't they? Um, too mollycoddled. But, and I suppose if there is a good thing, yeah, from, from collapse, it will be, yeah, that it'll be like in war when they say that, you know, young people grew up 
quickly, didn't they? Because they had to, because there was, but it was a real good time as well. Like Lovelock said, he was there, you know, doing science in the Second World War and it was an amazing time. He said it was, you know, pretty, pretty crazy, pretty, you know, dangerous, but it was exciting, you know. They had to solve problems and, uh, you know, people died around them, but it was, it was fun, like, you know, challenging. <clears throat> variety well i think that people the kids are only going to get in touch with the senses and start to um you know just develop um develop plasticity in their brains get some um, detox from from this um kind of virtual world that they're in at the moment when they lose their cell phones so i think they they have to lose the internet and lose the grid before they can start uh, appreciating life. I, I think they're at the point where they they kind of um, like, you know, mole rats or something like that. They, they, they don't know that they their addiction is uh, how damaging it is, their electronic addiction. And all they know is they just would die if they didn't have uh, an internet connection. But to actually find themselves, I think they have to, you know, get out in the mountains and in nature, get a bit of adversity, um, get something real. So stop this um, pseudo life and replace it with with some real shit. And so I think that, you know, that that's that's no. There's no guarantee that the grid's going down anytime soon, and the um, and the internet. So you know, I. I I think that it is the responsibility of doomers like us on the Extinction Army to to try and, you know, do rescues to try and um, explain all these bits, shock them, shock them as well. I like the, the idea, yeah, of, um, yeah, doing more kind of skills, um, trying to, I've been trying to do that, I've been meaning to do that uh, for ages, I go and do like a bushcraft course you know um there's quite a few people that do that um here in uk so you can go and spend like six days in the woods with a dude like learning traditional you know skills um uh, or foraging skills or yeah like a mushroom picking course that kind of thing i've done done the bits here and there or just like yeah learning yeah learning just fundamental bushcraft like how to make fire it's hard. It's not easy. <laughs> like it takes practice and you, dedication. You have to focus. Um, that, but that, I think that kind of thing really like is yeah spot on for just taking you away from yeah all the other shit. Um, oh yeah, and like fishing. I actually did a sea. sea um, Sophie mentioned seaweed. That's. I think you can you can eat almost all seaweed, which is crazy. Don't hold me to that, but. I think some of it you have to cook, but most of it you can eat. Apparently, obviously you don't want to be eating it if it's near um, near outlets and things. But yeah, there's so many and like shells, like picking it's, shells. It's, 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 agar. Of it's, it's, it's agar. So so it's, it's the stuff that they grow soil cultures in in petri dishes. So yeah, it's <laughs> it's kind of gelatin stuff. Yeah, you can eat it. And uh, picking picking shells as well. Um, <laughs> my former former girlfriend, uh, she was from Normandy on the northwest coast, and she was amazing at picking shells. It's a real art to it because she'd have to, you know, like because it was a sort of sandy beach with tiny few little pebbles, and it was usually when the shore was when the tide was out, and um, you just find like the sort of clay, um, you know, the, the softer sand and with the with all the, all the pebbles and um you just find these small depressions and she'd just know that i'd dig there and then she'd find a palord like um you know a, um i think it's in french is palord which is yeah a type of clam they were really tasty but really, really and she used to so she learned that when she was a kid and she would fill up buckets of that and then take it to sell at the restaurants <laughs> but the, it's like yeah a resource that not many people know it's quite a skill to find them um, of course, you've got to be careful because the tide comes in and then you get caught out and you're dead. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, careful of the wash, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah spe especially on the east coast of the UK. But, but um, 
Yeah, I, there's so many movies where people are, um, you know, taken out of the the comforts of civilization, and then that's such a big movie trope. They, you know, wind up in a plane crash or on a desert island, and get taken out of the comforts of civilization, and then they find that they start to appreciate stuff when they have to struggle a bit more and try to light a fire and fend off the, <laughs> the wild animals. And then, you know, they kind of mature and grow. That's such a, a Hollywood um, cliche, but I think it is true. I think, I mean, I've seen it in real life. I've seen the opposite. I saw one, um, one kid came out on this friend's boat and uh, he didn't like it because he said it's it's dangerous and scary and he can do the same thing in virtual reality with safely. So he said you know, he, he likes it and he likes sailing, but he, he says it's not worth the risk because it's, it's dangerous and, and, you know, he can do it in virtual reality just as well. And so that yeah, we were all appalled, but that's how bad it's got. Yeah, that just shows you how sick the mind has got if that i can't believe that that is uh, that's quite incredible isn't it that someone would say that <laughs> well I, I think that's some of the thing we must fold into our philosophy is that you must accept that a lot of people are lost cause right so a lot of the transhumanists um, all these these people uh, technophiles and stuff they they truly are a lost cause you just have to say that you know they're the sheep. <laughs> it, it, it's very, I can see why it's very attractive. A few years ago, I had a momentary blip where I started listening to stuff by like, this was, this was more than a few years ago, actually. It's probably about four, yeah, maybe three, four years ago. I remember I started, like, I came across stuff by like Ray, Ray Kurzweil and, you know, the, he's like one of these futurologists at Google and he's like, oh, well, we're, we're already bio you know, um, biomechanical, uh, you know, we're already cyborgs because our phone is like an extension and it won't be long until that's on your clothes and then it'll be integrated to your hand. And I was like, I was going along with it, you know, I, I was really getting into it. I had a few weeks of being like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is all good. And then I was just like, this is, this is fucking nuts. Like, I, yeah, I particularly, you know, later when coming across, you know, this this group and, and other sources and thinking, no, nah, that, that doesn't add up. This is, you know, that's crazy talk. Oh, so, so, yeah, that's so I'm, I'm kind of full on. I, I don't deprive myself. So um, I think there's a danger in getting very puritanical because, you see, that's part of the danger in the, the hippies and the left wing and the NXR and stuff is they start going on a moral crusade and then they start getting all sanctimonious and self-censoring and self-restrictive. And you say like, well, that's kind of macchio too. You don't want to go down that route. So I I allow myself to... So I, I don't admit to anybody uh, like on Exxon Med or on a, any of the Extinction Army, but I love all the technical stuff. I... I, you know, I can easily look at all that AI stuff and get into geeking out on it. But, you know, I, I know I can very quickly see that it's horrible dystopia. So, but I can, I can just as easily see where they say, you know, all this AI is like, oh, it's a wonderful time to be alive. Look at all this fabulous thing. So for me, it's like the, the movies. You don't take it seriously. You can enjoy it. You can, enjoy, you don't have to be, you see what I'm saying is, you can have all worlds. You don't have to be anti, anti the the tech or rockets and stuff like that, um, as a matter of religious principle. You you just because you know that it's fucked up. But it's it's kind of like a wonderful dream. So you can indulge in it, read science stuff, geek out on stuff, and say it's a wonderful dream. But you, you know we all fucked, right? No, nobody's going to Mars or something. So it it kind of uh, brings it to its fulfillment. And I, I would like to share that with people because it's it's not something you reject and degenerate. It's you really live experience, get the whole thing out of it, and that's part of the ripeness. And the, the that's kind of what I'm trying to communicate to people about AI and stuff. Not that, that it's evil and dreadful, which it is, but you don't want to not understand it. You want to, like, 
uh, you want to relish it, you want to experience it. It's like it's like being, you know, moralistic about cocaine or drugs or something. So then you get all Nancy Reagan about cocaine and you say like, yeah, but that's kind of wizened and miserable and kind of it's small and petty. It's it's much better to be somebody that, you know, can have cocaine, can enjoy cocaine and say, this stuff is fucking evil. I mean, it's fabulous. You know, have a trip and wow, see what it's like. But it means that you, you, you're you not addicted and you're not, a, a, you're not anti it either. You just see it absolutely for what it is. So... So I think it's important to not be um, religiously opposed to these things. You just must know them, understand them, and and then be be free of them. Because it, it's, a, you see, it's kind of drugs had a kind of control over Nancy Reagan. They dominated her life and stuff, just like any addict. It's just she was heavily opposed to them. But being opposed to drugs can dominate your life as much as. Uh, you know, and crusading against them can dominate your, your life just as much as somebody that's addicted to them. So I think that there, it's important to be uh, in, important in terms of liberation uh, and wisdom is to is non-attachment means that you're not scared of these things too. You don't avoid them. You don't moralize. You don't reject them from you know um, dogmatic principles. So you reject them because you understand them and know what they are. But you should be able to talk anybody down from bitcoin or from you know blockchain or rockets mars and you say, say it's glorious it's fabulous and even geek out more than them and be able to explain to them why you know it's fabulous but it's like cocaine what are you going to do with it man it's a it's a wonderful dream yeah exactly no i agree completely that is really well put because I, I had this, it was again, it was the same sort of conversation with the same guy on, on Saturday night around the fire, chewing the fat. And, and I said, look, I said, electric cars, you know, I, yeah, I get it. Like, I haven't been in one, but yeah, your brother's got one. Yeah, I'd like to go in it, it you know, yeah, like pure acceleration. Like, I love it. it, it yeah. But what, you know, it would have been, I'm such a, a utopian. It would have been lovely if... You know, back in 1911 or whatever, that guy, the first guy that invented the, the electric car, you know, and he got probably bumped off by Ford or the oil industry, didn't he? You know, like, if, what, imagine if we'd had electric cars from the start instead of the petrol engine and look where we'd be now, you know, we probably would be shooting for the stars. I don't know, but you just think, yeah, like, so you can indulge in it, exactly. No, um, no, but we wouldn't, though, would we? You, we wouldn't, though. We wouldn't. If we had electric no. cars... If, the, we would be we would be running out of cobalt. We would be running out of copper. The 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 there would be far less. Um, you see, the, the electricity is not a very dense fuel, so it would it you know the economy would be far smaller. There would probably be be as many people. They wouldn't live in such uh, high living standard, and the military would have all the would be using all the 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 carbon right. I guess I was making a simplistic argument to him to sort of shut him up and say, look, but look, it's too late. Like, you know, we're trying to do this now. It doesn't stack up now. Maybe it would have stacked up then. But yeah, I hadn't done the deep dive on this. I, you always do the, <laughs> yeah, of course, like there would be another problem. It wouldn't have solved. It's not like it would have solved the climate change. Of course it wouldn't. But it's just, yeah, it's that propaganda, isn't it, of the tech that it's just, it's funny. It's like, yeah, they... I think it it's wise to go back to I remember these books when I was a kid in the 80s you know and they were still kicking around these all these encyclopedias science encyclopedias from the 70s and it was like you know we're going to have you know like the whole road will have like magnets in it and it'll be able to charge it'll be all like you know well you know all these kind of things that Elon Musk is talking about you know that kind of thing but then you think well i thought it was supposed to happen in like 2020 <laughs> it's like flying cars and stuff it's like yeah we've had such optimistic utopian dreams but we it's like we're still doing that now even though we were doing that back then and you know where have we gone not very far it seems psychologically well, i think you, you can only be free of that stuff when when you really embrace it so you kind of get to a point where you think of all these people as freaking mad but it doesn't matter you can kind of enjoy their madness and uh, as much as they do so i mean i remember alvin toffler and the 
you know, futurologists from uh, the 1980s saying, you know, we would soon live in electronic cottages. We would all work from home on our computers. This was before the internet. It was very, very advanced. But we we never got to it. We never got to the electronic co you know, cottage and we never got to flying cars and we never got to the three-day work week. <laughs> so, you know, it's just... It's just a grand indulgence that I think you can't, it, it's not worth being too opposed to it because otherwise you, you're probably as trapped as somebody that the haters and the people that are technophiles are probably as captured by technology, but they're both is equally captured by technology. The only way to be free of it is to, is to use it, to be good at it, to indulge it, to, um, to see the fascination and the excitement and geek out on it and realize that you don't want it and and you don't get addicted to it so you you get all your you don't want to get um addicted to the buzz of it because one of the things that why people can't go out and connect with nature is because nature is just too damn boring there's not enough stimulus in uh, in nature anymore so People, the kids. If the internet goes down, kids are going to be drastically depressed for for a long time, years, because they have to come out of the the e addiction. They're not immediately going to go and enjoy the the sea and the wind and the trees and the sparrows. Um, they're going to be massively depressed that it's like fucking trees, wind, and they don't do anything. <laughs> a tree just sits there all the time. <laughs> And it, to get in tune with nature and see the moods of the sea and the, and get in tune with the weather and see, appreciate the sunsets so is like, for most people, I think they, you know, have to detox or and get to, you know, de-attenuate. They've been so habituated to this high stimulus so that they have to, they're almost like deaf people recovering their hearing. So they, they have to recover their sensitivity and it'll take a long time. I don't envy them getting there. But it is, as long as you know that, then you can, you know, as, a, as an older person that's not so immersed in it, you can uh, tear yourself away and, and, you know, slowly wean yourself off it so, so that you, you're neutral towards it. That's the aim, is to be neutral towards all these things. And then you, you're ready to let them go at any moment without loss, you know, without grief, you know. Yeah, it's um, it's so difficult. Yeah, it's so convenient. Um, I've struggled with it myself, actually. Yeah, it's. I mean, it. I mean, I, I don't think. I remember. Yeah, when the smartphones first came out, and I think I got one here yeah, in two thousand nine, and immediately I was like, oh yeah, like finally the internet actually works on a phone. Um. So yeah, it's great. It's allowed us to do all this. You know, like we can talk to people all around. But I suppose it's nice to think about it in that way. We have to use it for our own ends and but not get too attached to it as you say and start yeah shunning it which i do a bit more now i don't you know i try not to use yeah like all the things like facebook and google i've i've got a de-googled phone now so that's good <laughs> but, but i but i'm still using a blooming phone and i use it you know often at work but but it's yeah maybe a bit less tracking um and adverts which is nice <laughs> Um, but it, yeah, I, I, I love I, I, I it for, purely for resources of learning. I think for learning and trying to educate yeah. ourselves and communicate, it's just that is amazing. That's that's great. But as you say, yeah, just to, to know it could just go tomorrow, and yeah, you, there you go, it's gone. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, but I, I, I mean, I'm, it never gets old for me being able to Google stuff. I mean, I, I remember very well the days where just to find out one tiny bit of knowledge that you could Google now in five seconds, take you weeks, weeks to find out. So you'd have to hold things in your mind. It would take you endless amounts to find, you know, just the tiniest thing. Um, I mean, if you're going deeper than just, say, an encyclopedia, everybody had an encyclopedia and look up but if you need more than a paragraph on some subject you you would have to go down this long rabbit hole of reading book after book and you know ordering stuff in the library and stuff now you just google it and you can just endless amounts of information 
Do you, think, do you think that's contributing to our brain getting smaller or is that just domesticity? Because I've noticed it since, I think, as you say, like, yeah, I mean, I was a millennial. So, yeah, I, I, I vividly remember at school uh, when, I, when I started at upper school and they had rows of computers and I sat in front of the first desktop at school. Well, I'd, I'd sat in front of BBC computers, but this was connected to the Internet and I was like, what should I look up? Like, what, what can you do? Like, it was, it was only one picture of a dinosaur. <laughs> this was all you could look up. <laughs> I guess by then it was a bit more developed, but it was still just kind of, yeah, fascinating to, yeah. So, so it's, it's, to be able to look but, things yeah, up. I mean, as long as you appreciate it as a resource that's uh, about to go away. So it's, it's one of the man-made wonders of the world. You shouldn't forget that it is a wonder. It is an incredible wonder, but I mean, you've got to, to really appreciate it. You have to say that we've got to be in the last days of this. It's not like we go and live in the metaverse now. It's like, no, I can guarantee that ain't what happens next. <laughs> A few people will get suckered in to, to Zuck's game, but it's like... It's like it, it's yeah, my, hope, my hope is that, that yeah, somehow... There's, some, there's a lot more wrecking that happens using that technology, as we've talked about before. You know, the hacking and the, the wrecking that can be done with it, that would be good to see more of that. I don't know. Need to... <laughs> yeah, I think we should investigate getting in then. See, see what we can do to be disruptive in, in this metaverse rather than stay out of it, you know. Um, yeah. But... All right. Well, these are good things. It'd be nice to, to talk about this to you. Um, we, we covered quite a bit of what you raised, right? Didn't we? Yeah, we kind of. Sorry, we went off on a bit of a tangent. I kind of there was some more sort of things about the Domos, but I think that was a nice little chat. Yeah, I, I can't really think of why we were. Why Maybe we, started, we should do it again next going. week. You you wanted to ask more questions about the. Mammalian brain and adults and women and stuff. Uh, I think I was just, it was after that talk with Sophie, I was, I was, yeah, I was sort of, I think you kind of already covered it in a lot of the previous videos. And I just wondered if we delve into it from the male perspective of, because I remember you, with Hank, you brought up the whole thing of, oh, well, they always say, you know, it's a man, it's a men's world, it's a, it's a man's world, but it wouldn't be nothing without a woman. But then really it seems like actually the woman, it suited the woman because she had the, you know, it was, she, it allowed her to, it's like an against the grain, it allowed people, you could have more than one baby, couldn't you? Um, so did that, did the women, yeah, just press it home to the men or did the men just automatically say, oh, this is great, or were they a bit reluctant to, to, to settle down? Did they want to carry on going out and just hunting and being nomadic? I wonder how, how influential the women were in just being like, no, that's it, we're staying put. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, a couple of things. Well, maybe we should do this again next Wednesday and discuss it. But, but briefly, uh, the woman in general didn't want to get pregnant. The woman wanted an easier birth, an easier time. But ever since the, the start of agriculture, the men have wanted uh, babies because they, they want extra labor but to help them on the farm. The women have to, are generally trying not to have babies because they, they, um, well, they struggle in childbirth. It's dangerous. They've got to look after them. It's a big burden. So although women love babies and want babies, um, they, they generally try and restrict their fertility because uh, it's, a, it's a huge burden on them. But um, so... That's when agriculture starts. In a nomadic uh, tribe, I think they, they're far more neutral about it. They don't have such a, an idea of ownership of babies. But if you go back to like ancient Greece the, and ancient Egypt, they always looking for, for, for contraceptives. Women always. So there, there were, here in Greece, there was, a, there was a plant that was a very good contraceptive. Um, and it's extinct now. The woman used it so heavily that they wiped it out in Greece. I can't remember what it is. It's called sylvan or something like that. But it, it's a plant. I think it's been, it's certainly been wiped out in Greece. Um, I think it's maybe wiped out all over the world. 
Um, but even I, no, something tells me even the Aborigines use it. But anyway, it's a very good contraceptive. It worked very well. And, and uh, uh, you know, the woman wiped it out. So it shows you that they, they were really keen on contraception. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tempting to, it's interesting thing and to say who, who, which gender is responsible for the domus. Um, and I, I, I think it is, it is woman. Uh, but, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just extrapolating from stuff that I know from that I've seen with my own eyes in, in terms of indigenous populations and, and stuff in Africa, but certainly also um, you can see over and over again, I see this, this pattern that, that people try, um, try and hook me up with partners and on my boat, and I'm not really keen because I've seen the pattern over and over. You get this like uh, solo sailor like me. And then, you know, he hooks up with this woman and then you, you know what comes next. I've seen it time and time again. It's like, oh, you know, they're going to rent a, they're going to rent a little house on the, you know, on an island just for this winter instead of wintering on the boat. And then it's like, oh, well, we saw this place that was really awesome. So we're going to buy instead of just rent. And then the next thing you know is like, Ah, uh, well, we've got the boat up for sale because we don't really use it that much in the summer anymore now that we've got the house to work on. And then it's like, bye bye. <laughs> and that, you can always, the woman always drag the guy away from the boat and the sea and stuff. So, yeah, that, I, that, guess, I guess it's just that, that sort of cliche of a, the guy always wants to be down the garden in his shed or. <laughs> You know what I mean? Getting away and out. And I don't know. I mean, maybe that's too simplistic, but you sort of think, yeah, what, what is there something deeper there going on that she wants to settle and stay put? And yeah, yeah. women want a nest. Women want a nest. It's, it's a nesting instinct. But yeah, so yeah, because of that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I the, uh, yeah, the thing is that. I don't put a lot of credence in this like patriarchy that we're supposed to say that, you know, oh, we'd all live in a patriarchy. It's like, I'm not buying it. It's like, <laughs> that's not what I see. I, Britain is a matriarchy. Britain is a solid freaking matriarchy and always has been. So, but it's, um, my, my son is, my son was uh, saying that he wanted to do a, this, this comedy club he went to that you could do like five minute session as a newbie. And so he said he went to go and try his hand at doing comedy. So he asked me to write some jokes for him. And one, one of the ones I wrote was 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 like, uh, <laughs> my, my girlfriend says that all the shit that happens in the world today is because we live in a patriarchy. And I said, whatever, you're the boss. Yeah, that's a good one. I love that. <laughs> and it's pretty... And it's pretty and that's pretty much how I see it. Is that, you know, the woman's patriarch, the matriarchy is so, is is so entrenched that you're not even allowed to say it. You're not even allowed to say it's a matriarchy. You know, you have to pretend it's a patriarchy because you know, that's how how vice-like the woman's control is. But uh, yeah, the idea that men are really is like, come on, <laughs> go and look at your history. The, this whole feminist left-wing stuff is bullshit. I mean, you just have to, to, I mean, just peel back the surface a little bit and say, oh, all the wars are caused by testosterone and male aggression. And say, no. So you've got to, if you've ever seen a war, or you actually just go and pick up a history book and see what it was really like and say World War One. All those guys were volunteers in World War One, and they all went because the woman gave out white feathers. If you if you were caught in London, if you had some you know in civilian clothes during World War One, you'd virtually be ripped apart by all these shrews and crows and giving you white feathers or hitting you over the head with their umbrellas and stuff. So it's like, come on, man! It's like the, the, the men don't run like, off to battle because they've got overflowing with testosterone. And the women make them, and and it's it's like that all through history. Is like you go and look at the like the Spartans. The, the, the reason why the Spartans went to war 
and I've had this conversation with uh, Peter Marshall, who's written books on the subject about the Spartan woman. And um, yeah, there are some finer details he doesn't quite agree with me on, but it, it is in essence correct. The, the Spartan woman, uh, it was a matriarchy. And the reason why the men went off to battle is because the bloody women, especially their mothers, made them. So they, they were, the Spartan women would have the saying, they would say, the mothers would say to their sons, before they went off to battle is like, you know, come back with your shield or on it. And what, what that <laughs> meant was, Sorry, what, what that meant is if, if you lost your shield, it meant you you were defeated, you, you dropped your shield and ran. So it means you retreated. And so, you know, uh, if, so she's saying if, 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 you, if you retreat or lose your shield or something, don't come back to my house. I'm not, I'm not taking you back. And so he says the only the only way you can come back is either you know with your shield, otherwise victorious, or otherwise on it, dead. In other words, they you know carry you in a, like a stretcher on your shield. So that's what they that's what mothers used to say to their sons. So it's like, yeah, is this is this a patriarchy? <laughs> is, is this the sort? And I see over and over again. I've seen you know men are they get upset and do things of passion but over and over again i've seen a woman go to a guy into doing you know some act of violence or fight or something that he would never have got into if it wasn't for her pushing him you know manipulating yeah, I mean, um, you think um there's plenty of matriarchies wasn't there in in going back i mean iceland the icelandic culture and the vikings that was uh like matriarchal, I think. Well, they had one of the earliest parliaments, but I think they like in Denmark as well. The men are properly cucked, like they're <laughs> they're kind of yeah trodden down. Like and women sort of have the say so. And, and in Iceland, it's funny as well because they um, the women will make the first move. Like they generally will be you know like the ones sort of saying uh, like yeah, do you want to hook up for the night kind of thing. Uh, it's the other way around there. <laughs> And it's very much uh, the, the strong women culture. I'm not saying it's bad or good, but it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's just opposite. And then I don't know if um, did, maybe not in South America, but some other ancient cultures had yeah matriarchies, didn't they? It was the other way around. So it's definitely yeah. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not sure. It's very, yeah, I'm not sure it's very profitable to go too deep deeply into it is like a you know you get into the gender wars and it's kind of blame game quickly and then people can say oh yeah but during the middle ages then you know women had no rights and there was they had no rights of property and inheritance and stuff and you say well yeah but that's that's the legal side it doesn't mean that they didn't have the power behind the scenes you know? so it's it's always a little bit subtle and uh, you know if you but you got to look at history objectively with like Queen Elizabeth and you know stuff like that you know as opposed to Henry and you know stuff like that and that's a, like you can see like oh come on it's it's not, not uh, it's, it's to say that this is all a patriarchy is too much it's good to just we're not just to be clear for anyone listening we're not trying to get on a battle between the genders but just to say it's a bit more nuanced and complicated it's and so yeah is probably 50 50 in how things turned out but i just thought it was interesting to yeah to delve a bit into i don't know some probably food for another time with other people as well but yeah a bit more of the the gender i found it yeah it was interesting yeah the talk with sophie about yeah whether um someone was more you you were talking about yeah the ring finger i've got to look out for that now that was really interesting about whether or not someone had more exposure to testosterone was it in the in the womb i don't know yeah think, right, right. Uh, yeah. that was quite yeah. fascinating but it, the, the, and uh, also the, the whole gender fluidity the um that um, insight by sophie about the how when women get older they turn into they lose estrogen so they turn possibly more manlike and then guys yeah vice versa like guys get boobs and maybe get a bit softer <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is. You get lower testosterone levels, less aggression. Um, but the, uh, yeah, it's it's quite complicated, and it's. I think it's worthwhile 
getting into it in some respects, but dangerous because otherwise it just gets into, you know, kind of a heated war with uh, very unenlightened, um, without, without much positive outcome. But the the main the main thing I would say about it in terms of marital relations and stuff like that is um, people are not really aware that. Um, the kind of nuclear family and this idea that a you know a couple should get together is like it's it's a recent invention by the industrial revolution and it's utterly unworkable so if you know people get very self-conscious and blame themselves and each other for not being able to make relationships work and you say like look you're never supposed to get through life as a a man and a woman facing the world alone without a vast extended family to rely on and stuff. So it's just, it's like you're trying to do the impossible. So, you know, before you go to marriage counseling and listening to Oprah's advice on how to, you know, have a stable marriage and stuff, it's like, A, is all the guys that look like they have a stable marriage and stuff, they're faking it. <laughs> they look like there's no such thing as a happy couple. It's a myth. And the guys that, the, look like they're happy couples is like yeah you gotta look into the skin very often this is a really good subject because um i've been recently reconnecting with family and stuff and i didn't know much about my dad's side of the family but i know that and when you see these shows on tv like who do you think you are you know where they delve into family history but it is amazing like the shit that <laughs> goes on like you know i found out like my um, grandfather was left on a bus by his mother and then his auntie brought him up and all this kind of stuff because I didn't know much about my dad's side but you know and then often quite well, very often there was like a whole secret family going on you know not I don't think that's in my family but I've seen that it's the reoccurrence where it's like yeah I had a, another wife on the side with a, another second <laughs> so it's like you know it was and, and you know times were harder then so you know, there was social, you know, if, if a woman got pregnant out of wedlock, that was a major problem. And, and it was like, you know, my, yeah, my, my cousin, she was saying, yeah, uh, so my uncle and his, um, his wife, my uncle and auntie, they were shunned by our grandmother um, in the, you know, in the house when she got pregnant with my cousin. Um, the granddad was, he, sh he was sort nicely on them, but Apparently, yeah, the grandmother was not happy about that. But they couldn't rub two pennies together, you know, so they were having to, you know, start their family inside the home, you know, in, in back in, in the London suburbs in, like, the that would have been, yeah, in the 50s or, yeah, late 50s, I think. Uh, so, yeah, early early 60s. But, yeah, it's a... It's, yeah, as you say, I completely agree. Like, the nuclear family is just this idyll, isn't it, you know, that we've all bought into and, so yeah, modern invention it's completely unworkable so it's like why people are flogging this dead horse i don't know but yeah um yeah it's, it's also the same with, with families i learned early on as a kid i you know, i i thought our family was completely screwed up and i thought you know we're the only family i thought was why is our family so screwed up and everybody else has a nice family that gets along and doesn't have all these outrageous things and then later i found out no, they were just better at hiding it. The only thing that was different about our family is we didn't bother hiding it. Everybody else went to scrupulous lengths, and they had much worse relationships that were underneath this veneer of happiness and unity. And the, oh, that's a nice family and stuff. Is like Christ alone the stuff that would go on, but they were just good at hiding it, and we were just didn't bother. Then, yeah, then I realized, well, our, our family was screwed up, but not not that screwed up, <laughs> not nearly as screwed up as we thought. <laughs> yeah, it's a fascinating topic, uh, history and family, family history, definitely. Anyway, yeah, yeah I suppose we should, yeah. uh, that's what we've been going, yeah, almost two hours. Yeah, we okay, well, uh, well, that's great. So anyway, let's, um, I'll stop the recording, shall we? Yeah, grand. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>